A mí me encanta la idea de tener un hijo contigo, Yanis. Pero no sé si puedo permitirme ahora. ¿Vos reconoces el efecto que vos han reproché? No. Ella era consentante. Motherhood, consent, and a new take on the Western. That's all coming up in today's film show. And for that, I'm joined by critic Lisa Nesselson. Hi, Lisa. Hello, Olivia. Now, we're starting with someone who's been making films, uh, writing and directing for 40 years. Pedro Almodovar wrote his latest film, Parallel Mothers, during lockdown. It's out this week in France. It's about two women who share a hospital room and give birth on the same day. Tell us more. Well, Alma Duvar has diligently explored permutations of straight and gay desire, incorporating now and then the history of Spain, whether it's the impunity of pedophile clergy or, as in Parallel Mothers, the lingering fallout from the Spanish Civil War. 40-year-old Janice and teenager Anna, both single and pregnant by accident, are about to deliver their first babies. Now, Janice is pleased, but Anna is not. The film explores how the two women and their respective children affect each other's lives over the next few years, and it would be downright mean to give too much away. No spoilers then. Okay, Lisa, let's take a look at Penelope Cruz in that film. Now, Penelope Cruz there, one of the actresses, she's been working with Almodovar since the very beginning of her career, hasn't she? I think it's seven films this they made together. Uh, and her in an Almodovar film is always good news for those of us in the audience. A few months ago, she won the Volpe Cup at the Venice Film Festival as Best Actress for this performance. And uh, it's a fun fact to remember that she was the first Spanish actress to win an Oscar, an Academy Award, which she received in 2008 for her standout work in Woody Allen's Vicky Christina Barcelona. Parallel Mothers starts in Madrid in the winter of 2016. Janice, a photographer, is taking photographs uh, of forensic archaeologist Arturo, and she wants to know whether he'd be willing to help excavate a mass grave near the village where she grew up. It's where she believes that her great-grandfather's body was tossed during the Spanish Civil War, and the descendants of the roughly 100,000 people nationwide whose family members disappeared in that era are eager for closure and the government is not helping as much as hoped. That's an important story thread, but much of the action revolves around the unpredictable tug of romance, what, uh, what constitutes being a good mother, and how um, there are indications like a glass eye or a button which interpreted properly can give you as much information as a contemporary DNA test. Okay, fascinating. I look forward to checking it out. Next to a French film, actor and director Yvon Attal has adapted a recent best-selling uh, book for the screen, providing roles for his real-life partner and son. The accusation actually transposes a true sexual assault which happened in the United States to a completely Parisian milieu. I know the book was a success. Yes, the original French title, Les Choses Humaines, is that of the 11th book by French writer Karine Toul, which won several literary prizes in 2019. It's based on a true incident that took place on the campus of Stanford University in California in 2016. You could translate the book's title and the French film as Human Nature or Human Human Affairs, the accusation as a title doesn't beat around the bush. But this is a movie about the gray area in human behavior. Alex is a student at Stanford who makes what he believes will be a quick trip back to Paris to attend the ceremony at which his father, a major figure on French television with decades of distinguished journalism to his credit, will be decorated by the president of France. Alex's parents are divorced, and so he goes to see his mom, noted feminist commentator Claire, played by his real life mom, Charlotte Gasburg. She lives with literature professor Adam, played by Matthew Kasovitz. Adam has a teen daughter, 17-year-old Mila, and both adults encourage Alex to take her to a party. The party is a get-together of the well-to-do and entitled young movers and shakers Alex went to school with in France, and the alcohol and the drugs are plentiful, and so are young women not at all opposed to a rowdy good time. Something that allegedly took place on the periphery of the party will tear both of their families apart. Mm, sounds quite foreboding. Let's take a look at the accusation. 
Tu as porté plainte pour viol contre ton fils. Impossible, ça n'a aucun sens. Une enquête est en cours. Vous êtes placé sous contrôle judiciaire. Vous pourriez vous retrouver en prison. Notre fils, bon, c'est sûrement une folle. Et s'il l'a vraiment violé Mais Tu te rends compte de ce que tu dis Un homme peut mentir parce qu'il a peur parce que la réalité de ses actes lui paraît insupportable. J'ai rien fait, c'est un cauchemar. Il m'avait dit qu'il avait un couteau. Il vous a menacé avec ce couteau Ce sont seulement des questions, mademoiselle. Sa vie va être foutue La vie de qui, Claire La vie de qui va être foutue La vie de qui So there, the young woman, Mila, is accusing Alex of rape. What about us as the viewers? Do we have a privileged insight into what's going on there? Uh, no, actually, we don't. But this goes way beyond he said, she said. And that's what makes the film fascinating. It's about young people with two different takes on a shared experience. The film is divided into four chapters from the points of view of different characters and including the extensive trial almost three years after the uh, pivotal alleged assault. Early on, we see Mila against the wishes of her observant Orthodox Jew mother file a formal complaint, undergo a physical exam, and be given the morning after pill and an offer of counseling should she require it. The next day, there's a strident knock on the door where Alex is staying, and the police come in and start confiscating things. They say he's been accused of rape and place him under arrest. He says he has no idea what they're talking about. As far as he's concerned, if there was a sexual encounter, it was entirely consensual and as far removed from rape as, as it could be. This is a thought-provoking film with excellent performances and it couldn't be more topical. It certainly sounds like it's in l'air du temps, like in the air, as we say here in <laughs> France. Now, next to a film from New Zealand-born director Jane Campion. This is her eighth feature in 30 years, her first film since Bright Star in 2009. It's showing on Netflix in France this week. It's called The Power of the Dog. What should we know about this Western? Well, The Power of the Dog, set on a ranch in Montana in 1925, offers a pretty darn good eerie punchline, but it takes a long time to get there. It stars Benedict Cumberbatch as an over-educated, permanently disgruntled, land-owning cowboy, Phil, who raises horses and cattle with his cordial and unathletic brother, George, played by Jesse Plemons. Phil is the very picture of masculinity. He wears chaps and spurs everywhere, which makes sense if you do a lot of horseback riding, but probably doesn't help contribute to a good night's sleep if you happen to be indoors. His erotic impulses are a tad on the stylized side and he's a bully who taunts his brother. When the brothers and their cowhands stop at an inn run by a widow named Rose with the help of her willowy son Peter who happens to list and enjoys making paper flowers to decorate the premises. Uh, Phil is a major jerk by today's standards and just a guy by the standards of the era. Mm, certainly a masculinity of a century ago perhaps. Let's take a look at Jane Campion's The Power of the Dog. I wonder what little lady made these. I did, sir. <laughs> well, Brother Phil? Open up the gate, let him out. You sure he's not ready? Go on, let him out. It's just a man, Peter. Only another man. <laughs> So you said this film takes a while to get going. Is it worth our time? Well, I was lucky enough to see it projected on a real cinema screen. And uh, given the vistas and the decor, I can't really imagine how diminished it might seem on a TV or a computer screen. Streaming is the only way to see it here in France. Now, I don't ride, but I'm going to get on my high horse to share that a very recent study revealed that in France, 20% of Internet use each day is now devoted to people watching Netflix, specifically Netflix. Mm -hmm. Streaming draws on servers in a way that is horrible for the environment, so the temptation to just stay home and stream instead of going out to a movie really should be curbed as much as possible. If a film was so-so, we used to say uh, it's not worth the price of a ticket. For streaming fare, I think we should specify whether it's worth contributing to global warming or not. So, uh, my verdict is this. If you do watch uh, The Power of the Dog, which definitely benefits from an incredible performance from young Australian actor Cody Smith-McPhee 
then please take shorter showers and walk everywhere for about a week after. Okay, carbon footprint in mind there. Now, finally, to a film that felt very eerily prescient when it screened uh, in competition at the Cannes Film Festival this year, uh, the director, Kirill Serebrenikov, was not allowed to attend that event. This is Petrov's flu. The story here centers on a strange flu that spreads very quickly, and I flinched when listening to those sneezes on screen, I must admit, even though they were fictional. Yes, I know this doesn't necessarily sound like an experience anybody would deliberately seek out, but Petrov's flu is like a roller coaster ride on acid with a high fever. I got a real kick out of this, although it, it is exhausting to watch. The director made it after a long period of house arrest, and you can tell he just wants to take wing and be kinetic and outrageous. One reviewer said that some viewers may feel as if they're being waterboarded with vodka. In, so in post-Soviet Russia, Petrov is separated from his wife, Petrova, a librarian. The profession of the librarian is usually synonymous with a demure and bookish personality. Petrova's approach to people she doesn't like runs a counter to that, sometimes fatally. Everybody comes down with the flu, as in a pandemic, and the hallucinations start flying fast and furious. I imagine it'd be, be fun to read the book it was based on, but uh, it's uh, definitely fun to be plunged into these unrelenting, mostly deranged visuals. And out of the 24 films competing in Cannes this year, the cinematography here won the prize for technical excellence that dates back to 1951, which is called the Vulcan Award. And I wonder if Vulcans <laughs> need vaccinations or they just somehow know how to avoid the flu. Yeah, it's definitely a dark, psychedelic watch. Lisa, thank you very much for that roundup this week. We'll leave you with a taste of the award-winning photography in Petrov's Flu. Remember, you can get more movies news on our website and our social media feeds too. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this. А правда, что когда убийца умирает, вокруг его постели собираются привидения всех, кого он убил. Сказки это все. by France 24. From the workshop to the catwalk, follow the latest trends on fashion. From fine dining to architecture and much more, discover uniquely French talents on You Are Here. Straight talking and frank views from residents of France's tough suburbs who film their lives for the Bonheur Project. An in-depth look at political and social events shaping France in France in Focus. A quirky insider's guide to understanding France and the French on French Connections. Every day, watch France by France 24 on France 24 and France24.com.